Hello again. So this time around, I will introduce Professor Shippey. Professor Shippey was, uh, is known as a British medievalist scholar. He was, interestingly enough to us post-colonialists, someone who was born in Calcutta, right? So technically, he was born in India. And uh, he, therefore, oh, there you go. He, uh, however, grew up in, uh, in England, right? Another interesting parallel is that Professor Shippey followed a lot of Tolkien's own career in that he attended King's Edward School in Birmingham, occupied Tolkien's professional chair at the University of Leeds, and taught Old English at the University of Oxford, actually using Tolkien's original syllabus, right? Professor Shippey, if I'm doing anything wrong, please correct me. Uh, so some of the things that Professor Shippey have done include works on Old English studies, such as uh, his book on Old English verse, uh, discussions on Beowulf, poems of vision and learning in Old English. Uh, he has written, right, and, and this has been called one of the best works in uh, on Tolkien ever, uh, The Road to Middle Earth, which some of you I think have. Uh, there is also a collected uh, papers on Tolkien by Tom Shippey, and of course, uh, author of J.R.R. Tolkien, author of the century. He also wrote or edited uh, Beowulf, The Critical Heritage, uh, with Andreas Harder. He edited Jacob Grimm's Mythology of the Monstrous. He edited uh, Old English Philology, uh, co-edited by Professor Nydorf and uh, Rafael Pascual. There is a book called La I Laughing Shall I Die, Lives and Deaths of the Great Vikings in 2018. Other things that he've written of, the fairy tale structure of Beowulf in 1969, principles of conversation and Beowulfian speech, local patriotism and the early interpretation of Beowulf in 1994, Beowulf structure and unity in 1997. I cannot pronounce this properly, the fall of King Hathcrew, or Mises for A, the chapter Arbach never wrote. Names in Beowulf in Anglo-Saxon England, 2014, and Beowulf studies from Tolkien to Folk in 2016. He also wrote Beowulf and the North before the Vikings in 2022. He's still writing, right? Constructing nations, reconstructing myth, essays, and these are already works in honor of him, right? Uh, in 2007, right? Tolkien in the New Centuries, essays in honor of Tom Shippey in 2014. Literary Speech Acts of the Medieval North, essays inspired by the works of Thomas Shippey in 2020, just to give you an idea of how much influence he's already had, right, on scholarship, on uh, Tolkien and medieval literature. He had a course called The Great Courses, uh, Heroes and Legends, the most influential characters of literature in St. Louis University. He was the film consultant for the trilogy. So if you're wondering, you know, uh, how his influence was also felt and you saw his influence in the movies, right? He also wrote fantasy. So he was actually John Holm uh, in these books. Uh, he wrote under a pseudonym, but it's an alternative history of uh, England, right? The Hammer and the Cross series. And then, of course, there are documentaries such as this one uh, on, on Tom Shippey, another one about from Epic History TV. Right, and this last one is a very current book from Uppsala Books, uh, Beowulf, a translation of Beowulf and commentary, translated by Tom Shippey and uh, with a commentary by uh, Professor Niedorf. Right, so I think I've said enough. <laughs> I think you'd like to hear from the Professor Shippey himself. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Tom Shippey. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I can't see you, but I hope you can see me and you can hear me. Uh, I'm sorry to say, though, that uh, seeing me is not a pretty sight. Uh, I celebrated my 80th birthday two weeks ago, and then I had to have dental surgery. And that's what's caused this. Uh, and then the day after I had the surgery, uh, I found out that I'd contracted the COVID virus, and that's what uh, makes my voice sound a bit strange. So if I look strange and I sound strange, I hope you'll forgive me. Having said that, after I'd given my title for this talk, 
60 years of Tolkien, I started wondering, was it, was it really 60 years? I know it was a long time ago. Well, uh, I found some evidence to prove it really has been 60, and here it is, my copy of The Fellowship of the Ring. You will see that it has a gold stamp on the front. Uh, now, it's much too difficult to try and read the stamp, but what it is, is the seal of King Edward School, Birmingham, which is the school Tolkien attended and uh, the school which I also attended. And the seal shows our founder, King Edward VI, who established the school in 1554. And I remember it's 1554 because 400 years later, when I was 11, I had to learn the school's quatrocentenary song, which is composed in honor of our 400th anniversary. I could sing you the song if you liked, but I think perhaps now is not the moment for that. Um, well, why does my book have this stamp on it? It's because I bought it with a book prize awarded by the school. And you can see uh, that the prize was awarded back in 1959, which is indeed 64 years ago. Well, uh, this tells us something which people have forgotten and indeed now find hard to believe, which is that the Lord of the Rings was not expected to have popular appeal. It wasn't intended to have popular appeal, and it certainly wasn't priced to have popular appeal. Back in the 1950s, when it came out, it was only available in hardback, and it was only available in a three-book box set. And uh, I will hold up the box set so you can see it. Um, you can see it's uh, quite a heavy item. And furthermore, it has a price on the front, and the price is 63 shillings. Well, quite what 63 shillings would be in modern money, I don't know, because you have to allow for inflation. But it was um, 30 times the price of a regular paperback. Um, so I think we were in the equivalent of uh, hundreds of dollars. And back in the 1950s, as a teenage schoolboy, uh, I didn't have the money. So the only way I could read the book uh, was to win the prize. I didn't buy it. I won it. Well, uh, that, that was the start of my interaction with Lord of the Rings. Well, um, going back, Lord of the Rings was not expected to be popular. It was marketed at the top end of the market as a prestige publication. And it stayed like that until Ace Books brought out their unauthorized paperback edition in the USA in 1965. That was when Tolkien started to become a major figure in popular culture. And that's when I got yeah. drawn into the cultural argument. As I say, it was when the paperback came out in 1965 that Tolkien became a major figure in popular culture. And that's when I got drawn into the cultural argument. What happened was that by 1969, I was a very junior member of faculty at the University of Birmingham, uh, right opposite the entrance to King Edward's school. So I hadn't moved very far in the 10 years since I left school. And at this point, it was decided to stage a Tolkien day. It was called an afternoon in Middle Earth uh, and uh, at a local conference center. And I was asked to speak at it. Now, um, I wasn't going to get paid for this, and it wasn't going to bring me any credit at the university, but it just goes to show that when you're young, you should take all opportunities because you never know what is going to happen. And my little presentation back then on November 30th, 1969, changed the course of my life. I have the program for the event, and as far as I can see, absolutely nothing happened the way it was supposed to. Tolkien was supposed to be there, but he couldn't come, and he sent a polite apology. Well, that's Tolkien's little apology. I wish I could be with you. My father's and my mother's family were Birmingham people. I was born far away, but came home in 1895 and have remained a Birmingham man ever since. So that was Tolkien's profession of, uh, of um, local loyalty. However, other things at this conference did not happen the way they were supposed to. This is the program, and I know you can't read it, but uh, I can tell you what's, what's in it. 
Donald Swan was supposed to come and sing Tolkien songs, but he too didn't get there. Um, I was booked only to take part in a panel discussion at the end, uh, but something must have changed because actually I still have my, uh, my script from, the, uh, from that day, uh, and here it is. And uh, as you can see, it's quite, a, quite a, a bulky one. It's about 12 or 14 pages. So I think what must have happened was that with these non-attenders, um, the three people who did get there uh, were asked to uh, not just take part in a public discussion, but also to present papers. Uh, and we all delivered then fairly long papers instead. But this didn't go well at all. Um, one speaker was a Jungian psychologist, and she talked about Jungian psychology, but not about Tolkien. The next was a specialist in children's literature, and she talked about children's literature, but not about Tolkien. So I was on third and last, and by this stage, the audience in the conference center were all heading for the exits. So I told them all to sit back down again, because I was going to talk about Tolkien, and that's what I did. Now, as it happened, Tolkien's secretary, Joy Hill, was in the audience, and after it was over, she asked me if she could have a copy of my paper to show to Tolkien, and I gave it to her, keeping only my carbon copy. No computers back in those days. If you wanted a copy, you put carbon paper in your typewriter. Well, that was the start of things for me. But there were two other things about the program which struck me even then, and they're still happening today. One of them was that Tolkien was popular, and so people were trying to claim him for their own subject, whatever that was, Jungian psychology or whatever. The other was that people were still nervous about him being popular. You can see the organizers really quite worried about whether uh, Tolkien was an appropriate subject for a conference. Um, the cult has, uh, around the Tolkien books, has damaged their serious reputation. Well, um, I must say, I couldn't care less about uh, Tolkien's serious reputation, uh, but other people did. Uh, they weren't sure whether he was acceptable as a serious subject or not. Well, my view was that Tolkien was a very serious author. It was just that what he was serious about was something far too few educated people knew anything about, and that was the nature and history of languages. Well, I figured that that was the key to understanding him. You had to understand Tolkien as a philologist, and you can see uh, uh, my statement there, uh, really, as a reply to the uh, academic anxiety which other people felt. Well, uh, as it happened, uh, when I said that uh, that, uh, that was the key to understanding him, uh, Tolkien agreed with me. Uh, and here, in fact, is his reply to my paper, which Joy Hill had given him. Well, now, perhaps I'll just read the start of it. Dear Mr. Shippey, forgive me. I must have seemed curmudgeonly never to have at least thanked you for sending a typescript. Uh, I have been under considerable pressure, especially increasing age, which shortens time. I don't like to fob people off with formal thanks when they've taken much care and trouble. But this is too often been the result uh, that they get nothing at all. In fact, I have only just read your paper, author as a philologist. And he goes on to say that um, I find your discussion admirable, one of the nearest to my heart or the nearest of the many that I have received. Uh, well, and then he says in a sort of a way that he still thinks I got some things wrong. Well, just the same, this was uh, a considerable encouragement to me, um, and it was increased a few years later. What happened this time was that I was awarded a fellowship at St. John's College, Oxford, from the University of Birmingham, and this was a big promotion for me. And when I got there, Norman Davis, Tolkien's successor in his Oxford chair, took me off to meet the old man, as he called him, uh, and the three of us had dinner together at Merton College. Well, people say that I missed an opportunity there to ask Tolkien all kinds of things. But when I got there, I thought that Tolkien, by then, late in 1972, had been interviewed many times, and he didn't like it much. 
so I thought we should behave instead like a couple of hobbits. And I just told him the local gossip from Birmingham, what was happening at the school, what was happening at the rugby club, and so on. He was very interested in the rugby club and asked me who was on the fixture list these days. And then he asked me who was in the team these days. And I realize now that he was wondering, as I ran through the team sheet for him, uh, that he was wondering whether some of the guys I knew were the sons or grandsons of people he knew. He was especially interested in a guy called Peter Neve. And though I didn't realize uh, at the time, I now realize that that was because Tolkien's aunt, who lived in Bag End, was called Jane Neve. And he thought Peter might be a relative, perhaps a cousin of some kind, as perhaps he was. So we had a good evening, and I would have liked to talk to Tolkien again. But of course, this was late 1972, and he only had a few weeks to live. So I didn't get another opportunity. Just the same, this meeting probably accounts for the next Tolkien-related event in my life. I went to a fantasy conference in Dublin, and once again, there are lots of people talking about Tolkien and philosophy, or Tolkien and sociology, but none of them seemed really very interested in Tolkien. So they were just using him as a uh, peg to hang their own preoccupations on. Well, on the plane back from Dublin, I was looking out of the window and I was thinking, gosh, that was awful. Poor old Tolkien would be very unhappy about the things they're saying about him now. You know, someone needs to set the record straight. And as I thought that, I felt a cold sensation deep inside. Uh, because when I thought someone needs to set the record straight, I thought, and who would that be? And the answer was, obviously, it was me. Note that this wasn't going to do me any good professionally. Tolkien was still not a serious topic for academics, but there was no doubt it was my job to do it. We'd gone to the same school. We played for the same rugby team. I was teaching his academic subject, Old English. Very soon, in 1979, I would occupy the same chair that he did uh, 50 years before at the University of Leeds. So it was my duty to speak up for him. And the result of that in 1981 was my book, The Road to Middle Earth. Well, that's a brief summary of, um, of the, the, the main aim of the road to Middle-earth. Another way of putting it would be to say that I was trying to see Tolkien in a historical context. And the historical context was the great tradition of comparative philology, established long ago by Jacob Grimm of Grimm's Fairy Tales. I saw Tolkien as the English Grimm. And it is rather surprising, actually, Grimm was a great philologist, and the great bestseller of the 19th century was Grimm's Fairy Tales. Tolkien was a great philologist, and the bestseller of the 20th century was The Lord of the Rings. So actually, being a philologist is a good idea if you want to become a bestseller, shall we say. This is what people have tended to forget. Well, uh, The Road to Middle-earth went very well uh, as a book. Uh, though not in the academic world, but I, I didn't care about that. Uh, and it was not for some time that I actually had another idea about Tolkien. I think in my life, I've only really ever had two, two ideas. The first one was to see him in a historical context, and the other one was to see him in contemporary context. And that attempt to see Tolkien in contemporary context emerged as my book, Tolkien, Author of the Century, which came out in 2000. And this is how it starts. Yes, well, that was the first sentence. The dominant literary mode of the 20th century has been the fantastic. That was a very uh, aggressive claim. But uh, when people have um, commissioned polls of the most popular books uh, which people have read during the 20th century, uh, it is uh, fantasy works which, which dominate them. Uh, works like 1984, like Lord of the Flies, uh, like uh, Harry Potter, like Tolkien and others, one or two of which I'll mention later. Um, all these were prominent writers of fantasy. The books are all very different, 
But it seems to me that they all share, well, two things. One is that they are preoccupied with the nature and origin of evil. And that is because they are works of the 20th century when evil seemed to make a very strong reappearance in the real world. Well, they all offer different answers to the problem of evil. Uh, and that's because, of course, each author has had to work out his own separate reply. Uh, there's another thing, though, that connects the authors. And this is what I, I noticed all of a sudden. Um, they'd all been shot or else they had been shot at very seriously. They were all combat veterans. George Orwell had been shot through the throat uh, in the Spanish Civil War. Not many people survived being shot through the throat. C.S. Lewis, Tolkien's friend, had actually been left for dead on the battlefield. Meanwhile, Tolkien, as we know, uh, had fought on the Somme. Golding had spent, William Golding, author of Lord of the Flies, had spent six years uh, uh, in motor torpedo boats uh, in the English Channel. Um, and then there was Kurt Vonnegut. Kurt Vonnegut, who wrote Slaughterhouse-Five, a very strange book, but a fantasy. Well, I uh, had dinner with, uh, with Vonnegut quite a few years ago and uh, talked to him about it. And the thing is this, Vonnegut uh, had been captured uh, as, a, as a soldier in 1945 and had been shipped across Germany to uh, the city of Dresden. And uh, he was in the city of Dresden the night when the British firebombed it and destroyed the whole city and pretty much the whole population. As Vonnegut said, we went down into this cellar and when I came up, everybody was dead. Um, it's noticeable also that Vonnegut knew, had no idea what was happening. Uh, he was only a teenager. He didn't speak any German. He didn't know where he was. He didn't know what was happening. Uh, and he couldn't explain it once it had happened. Well, he told me, and I thought this is really interesting, that um, I asked him, I think, why it took him 17 years to write his account of events. And he said every day of those 17 years, he got up wanting to write about it, but he didn't know how because he couldn't make sense of anything. And so he wrote it in the end as a kind of combined memoir plus science fiction book. That was the only way he could um, understand things. Well, I thought that was uh, very revealing. Uh, and my suggestion was that these fantasy authors were all what I called traumatized authors. They had all suffered very serious trauma in their lives, and they were writing fantasy uh, to attempt to explain it. And the trauma they were all suffering from was really uh, industrialized warfare. That was an entirely new experience. They couldn't make sense of it. The spokesmen and, uh, and interpreters of their culture couldn't explain it either. They had to make sense of it for themselves. Well, this was really, I thought, a very striking development and one which had not been properly noticed. You remember that uh, back in, the, in uh, uh, 1969, the organizers of the Tolkien Day were worrying about, uh, about uh, uh, people with a serious reputation. But it wasn't the people with a serious reputation who were responding best to events of the time. It was the writers of fantasy and science fiction. They were the ones who had a better idea of what was happening and what had happened and why. Well, now is not the time for me to try to explain Tolkien's underlying philosophy, not at the very end of what has been a, a personal memoir, but I'd like to say two things. One is that after thinking a lot about Tolkien's Catholicism, to which I'm an outsider, having been brought up as an Anglican, what I really think became a major goal for Tolkien was to explain, or rather to illustrate in his story, the nature of providence, and to explain how that can be reconciled with the doctrine of free will. 
I explained this at some length in a conference in Italy a few years ago, and I was very pleased and rather surprised that for once my do-it-yourself ideas of theology in fact met with approval. This is part of the article which I wrote, which was translated and reprinted in Osservatore Romano. And Osservatore Romano is the journal of Vatican City. So in a way, I seem to receive the uh, stamp of approval from the Pope. And that, uh, that surprises me very much. But also, of course, I'm really quite pleased. Well, you can see what I think about, uh, about Providence. Um, it, so many things appear to be the result of chance, but they aren't chance. You can see that quite clearly in Lord of the Rings, when people say things like, just chance, as we say in Middle Earth, and that means it's not chance at all. Um, they're the result of chains of decision. Everyone makes their own decisions because they have free will, but providence is the result of all the decisions, and they're woven together in a providential way. And we human beings cannot understand that. We can't see it because we don't have enough of a perspective. As, uh, as Tolkien says, I think it's actually Gandalf who says it, even the wise cannot see all ends. Well, that, I think, is what I reckoned about, uh, about uh, Tolkien's Catholicism. But there's one other thing I, I'd like to say, and that is that I now have a website. And it's quite simple. It's called tomshippy.com. And if you look at that website, and then you click books, and then you click medieval studies, you will see that in my two most recent works, I've had, uh, I, I still have quite a lot to say about Tolkien, specifically about Tolkien's long engagement with the poem Beowulf, which occupied him for at least 60 years. So I've had 60 years of Tolkien, and Tolkien had 60 years of Beowulf, in fact, probably more than 60 years of Beowulf. And I've been trying to uh, make, uh, well, to, to trace that and to see how his thought developed. Well, what that tells us, I think, and I'll conclude with this remark, 60 years or no 60 years, there is always more to be said about Beowulf and also about Tolkien. And uh, I hope that these things will continue to be said. And now uh, I'll be very happy to answer questions if, of course, I can. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shippey. Uh, before... Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and please follow our pages on Twitter and Instagram under the name at Uppsala Books.